what I like about this conference is it's cutting edge. Uh, you know, if you've been to uh, Anchor's conference, it, it's all colored within the lines, doing it exactly the way the book says. Um, I don't believe that the book has brought enough lines for us to put this type of nutrition. That's nothing against the organic certification. We believe we exceed the organic certification by miles. Uh, you know, we're never adding glyphosate or, or using any herbicides on a product. I want to make that clear. The other thing is it brought to my attention that what was said in the program is value-added marketing. We're not marketing here. We want you to have a crop that you can measure, that you can measure on a certified lab to bring it to market to get paid for that value. With that said, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Robert Ben Rissingham. Uh, I'm the founder of Match Renewable and Soil Solutions. Uh, Dr. Paul Washburn uh, has just come on the staff, but he's not in the. Uh, we, we met now for about six months. Um, you know, we're working together on this because the work that we're doing is actually food is medicine, and I'm not a doctor. If you uh, if I go the right direction here. The disclaimer that I need to put on here is I'm not a doctor, so if you listen to me, it's your own fault. Uh, it's for medical conditions. What, what we, uh, the other disclaimer that we have is our posters that we're using are actually out from a USDA.gov site. They're not out from an FDA site, but all the information that we're presenting as far as how these minerals can actually heal you is documented. You can find it online. You can actually find the doses of some minerals online. Uh, if, uh, if you just Google Dr. James Duke database, um, it's easy to find, and uh, it's an amazing database if you have not been on. How long have you received the like, I'll get into Dr. James Duke a little bit. Uh, Dr. James Duke has been with the USDA for 40 years, agriculture research. Is, is anybody not familiar with his database, or anybody familiar with his database, I guess? You familiar with it? <laughs> You know, that's that's amazing. That's amazing that only a few people have seen that. If you haven't been on that database, that's where most of the formulations for our drugs come from, is that database. If, if you were to uh, take any one of these conditions that you see on the chart, um, we're only looking at the minerals. If you were to, to look at anti-tumor breast cancer, you would see the selenium dose that you need, but you'd also see all the compounds that plants make. We'll get into that towards the end of the, the uh, uh, this, this talk. And uh, what, what we'd like to do is, um, we'd like to make it clear that we will answer any questions at the end. This information is so complex for you to absorb it, for everybody to absorb it. Questions will just make us chase rabbits. And we'll get to the end, and, and, and gladly answer any questions even all night long if we have to, to ensure that, we, that our message and what we're trying to do can be retained. So I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Paul Washburn. Um, Dr. Paul Washburn is a medical doctor. It's, uh, he has a nonprofit uh, health medical institute in Cheyenne, Wyoming. We're both from Cheyenne, Wyoming, which is just a, a great blessing to, for, for us to collaborate and work together. But here's Dr. Washburn. And by the way, we're switching mics because we've got one mic. Um, as he, he articulately stated, I'm the director of the Health Medical Institute. It's a medical clinic, actual physical clinic. I see patients every day. I also do collaborative research. Um, that's specifically part of the nonprofit guys. Um, and I did meet him this past year. Uh, and his concept when he walked in the doors, I was locked up one day, was mind blowing. Very in par with a lot of the research that I do, the philosophy I hold. I'm an internal medicine doctor, I'm a preventive medicine doctor, I'm a lifestyle medicine doctor, and a public health physician. All that comes together to a very unique combination where the traditional Western medicine meets the lifestyle, uh, preventive medicine side of things that really is an up and coming market for all of Western medicine. If you ask me, it's actually the oldest type of medicine who's gone awry from that. <coughs> I don't have any disclosures. I'm not being paid for this. I do it out of morality in my heart. I believe in what I do. I believe in what Bob's doing. Okay. Um, 
First, uh, I'd like to bring up a paper that's incredibly true and dear to my heart. It took me two years to write this. <laughs> health ballistics, published years ago. Quantifies someone's preventive health measures for a lifetime by looking at retrospective data. Makes it into a, no a nominal value. That means if you change one factor, one variable, you impact things throughout someone's lifespan. Not all variables are equally weighted. You having a large or medium sized cup of coffee probably won't terribly impact your day. You getting out of bed versus not getting out of bed drastically impacts your day. This is a rudimentary form of the equation. As you see, number one is the evidence weighted variable uh, nutrition. Go figure. As you go down the line, sleep, fitness, social, never tobacco, broken up into two subcategories. The second part of the equation. Value of a group or a generation of rubric. So, if there's collaboration out there besides uh, classic medicine doctors, but other agricultural folks and who are interested in collaborating to make a rubric that we've already begun to generate, that would be highly anticipated and highly appreciated for input. This is one component of the theory as well. It has to do with somebody who has a health behavior value of a zero, zero, which is basically dead or a one zero, which is you are infinite. When someone has a point one, a point two, it's very hard to bring them back up into a positive spectrum. But once they are at this teetering point, this is the fulcrum point where it's actually really easy to have the weight go either way, it's actually quite easy to have somebody go into a highly effective disease-free realm because they're seeing the benefits of pressing over this minimal threshold point. A lot of us in America are at that point. Some of us may have one disease or two or five. I see people who are on 18 different medications every day. And they're down here somewhere, and I try to get them to press this point. I'm also part of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. I'm a, one of the first inaugural year board certified lifestyle medicine physicians in the world. There were 208 years ago. It basically doubled this past year. I was asked to write questions for the board review. Lifestyle medicine is my passion. If anybody here is interested in lifestyle medicine, there are two certifications. I put this out there for everyone in the community and the globe to listen to because there are provider certifications and non provider certifications. Lifestylemedicine.org. What they're trying to do here is actually get a new vital sign list going. This is a general, rudimentary, basic vital sign list. But again, you'll notice one very crucial factor. Number one, nourishment. And this is a self perceived scale. Some women may not even know their disease, their disease written or they're actually sick. But they don't feel well. And that's the first step in the conversation. Biomimicry. We use our environment, we learn from our environment. Our environment is smarter than us. It's very simple. When the practice of adapting nature's best ideas to the uh, attention of healthier, more sustainable technologies for people. When that comes about, we look at ants, how to make highways. Uh, we look at certain plant products uh, that fight off insects. These are something that has been around for thousands and thousands, millions of years. So we must listen to where nature tells us. More on biomimicry, very bottom here. The more our world functions like the natural world, the more likely we are to endure on, on this home that is, that is ours, but not ours alone. I jump into epigenetics really quickly. There's this, genes are something that over the last few decades has exploded. I am a firm believer that our current environment is something that impacts us more than we ever know currently. It's been shown in rat models, the carbohydrate diet provided to them in just one generation affects certain gene expression that allows them to store more adipose tissue or not store adipose tissue. It has been proven through generations of human development, our grandmothers affect the egg inside of their child's womb just two or three generations down the road. Those are massive complications of what we need. If someone is starving, for the next generation, this just makes sense to me, the next generation probably will want to be able to genetically store carbohydrates better. But in an environment that is overrun with carbohydrates, that is a negative detriment to that particular line of the species. 
We are not resolved or resolved from that. I'm not going to read this, but it basically says that epigenetics probably has something to do with how we live, and plants impact that greatly because it is and should be the number one basis of our diet. Bob said this. <laughs> there's a, there's a too many people that are going to quote everything I say. But, uh, you know, what we live in a, a world right now that's unbelievable. Um, our technology is exploded. We have libraries together that uh, we haven't seen since Alexander of Egypt, and they're at our fingertips. We don't have to travel. Um, the ability to correct nutritional problems in our diet um, is, uh, is at our fingertips. We have, you can see the XRFs out on the table with uh, biodutrients trying to do with the handheld device is incredible. Um, the work that we have in different labs is, is incredible. Although at the end of the program, we'll talk about some of the analysis that we have and some of the analysis you can easily obtain affordably. But uh, what, makes, what makes everything different in our time What makes everything different in our time period right now is we've identified mental deficiencies over 100 years ago, that we would have that problem that we're seeing today 100 years ago. Uh, Dr. Beeson, uh, um, if you Google his work, we'll put a slide up of it. But at the time that he produced his studies was 1920. The ability to correct that problem was impossible. The ability to have implements, if you even owned a tractor in 1920, you were doing good. The ability to find chemistry and minerals to put back into the soil was impossible. It wasn't until World War II that we had that revolution. But the biggest part is the ability to analyze plants and to see what's in the tissue of the plants that allows us to correct everything. It's awkward to get into my code, but we'll do it. All right, um, some of the misnomers and some of the uh, multiple descriptors that are out there, and, and as I was going through this, I, I found all these different terminologies which are very similar, actually. Estimated average requirements, recommended daily allowance, adequate intakes, dietary reference intakes, uh, population reference intakes, tolerable up, upper limit levels. They all kind of have some sort of recommendation what you should have in your diet. But not one of them is uniform. Uh, the known, we have identified minerals. We have specific labs and equipment to measure these minerals. We have abilities to work soil. We all know people want to be healthy. I don't know a single person that says, oh yeah, I'd rather be sick. I want to take medications. I want to lose productivity in my job. I know we have one diet saying it's premature, so I don't consume kind of pills. That, that just never happens. People want to know uh, quality. One of the key things that I've noticed, this is just because I want quality food, I walk into a grocery store, there's nothing in there that says this carrot has this specific concentration of nutrient <coughs> density, quality, bio oral availability, it doesn't break down the macro micronutrients, it doesn't say how long it's been in storage usually either, which isn't necessarily something we're going to be talking about, but it is another component or compounding factor here. The unknowns. We don't know the maximal uptake and concentration of nutrient for individual plant or fruit or byproduct or whatever it is that comes off that plant or from the soil for that matter. Optimal soil conditions for closed loop optimal nutrient uptake based on biosynthesis and bioavailability. We don't know the actual optimal soils too. We don't know the ribosomal layer, uh, layer nutrient, biosynthesis, and bioavailability impact on successive generations of crops or on what one crop cycle will actually produce. We have a good idea, and we've seen historically what some of the produce is that comes out of the field based on certain ABC variables. But we can't actually, with a specific instrument right in this moment, actually say, what is this that I'm eating in front of us on my plate? And there's also bioecological uh, epigenetic footprints that we're beginning to unravel. And I think that actually is one of the most massive, underestimated, under-researched components currently. And 
that is exactly why Natchez Noble sparked my interest when Bob walked out. Uh, Rodell Institute, or Dr. Rodell, I, I wrote a book uh, on the complete uh, book of composting. You know, and in that book, it was it's an excellent book. You know, it went through many, many re, uh, uh, prints. Um, but the key part on this here was uh, Kenneth uh, Beeson's work that was described in uh, Chapter 17. When when, uh, when he put out this report, you can find this report online, you can find a lot of good reports on his work. He was sounding the alarm of, of the quality of our soil that we would see today. Um, once again, the ability to have the implements at that time to correct it wrong. I believe that the people that seen that report with money knew what to invest in. That was the medical side, the drug companies, because that was the only way to combat uh, what the, what that report said was coming down the road. You know, soil leaching is our biggest enemy. And if we look at so soil leaching is our biggest enemy. Uh, if you were to go through the history of time and see the biggest changes in lifespan, it actually happens when the soils were depleted. Um, this is all yours. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So, in essence, um, a lot of the work that I've done in the past has been from a preventive nature. I, I love to look at the CDC. I love to look at the United States Preventive Service Task Force. I like to see these recommendations that come out because they're broad spectrum, US based government agencies that have done a lot of research. However, I notice a flaw in a lot of this. Um, a lot of it is, is, is maybe not tier one or tier A recommendations which they should be, and I'm going to get into that in a second. 90% of national of the nation is 3.3 trillion in annual health care expenditures of people with chronic and mental health. <coughs> this is amount of trillions. So we'll look at the date, 1960, 2000, 2010, 20, 30, something out here, right? One trillion, two trillion, three trillion. That is an exponential curve. Okay. That is unsustainable. It is not in congruency with population growth. If it was in congruency with population growth, and I did the law to both of those, it'd be a straight line, and there'd be no problem because one dollar back in 1960 per head would be equal roughly to the same value now. Don't think about inflation because that would still make it a straight line if you did the right math. However. When you change this and you and you look at it from the population approach, you'll notice that this line is the growth of the human population and then compared to the growth of the health expense of our country. That's bad. Health and economic costs of chronic disease per CDC. As of just a few days ago, I double checked this to make sure that it was accurate and on point for today's presentation. They have a list of certain things that they believe are chronic disease. Now, this is not all encompassing. However, it does show where priorities lie. Okay? If they think these are well relevant to put out there, then this is kind of the list they say. Heart disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity, arthritis, Alzheimer's, epilepsy, and tooth decay. Now, those are all chronic diseases. Risk factors, though, for or for these conditions in general. And these, again, are the ones that are selected to represent under a particular website or the CDC, actually on the CDC websites. Cigarette smoking, lack of activity, and excessive alcohol use. <laughs> now, when I saw that, I was like, normally when you put out a hand-selected amount, you would probably be the most impactful variables, right? Well, not on here is nutrition. So when you go into this, there are other links that you can go to to find some of this nutrition and stuff, and it basically has a very general rubric for eating healthy. Um, and when you look in the center, it has a healthy eating for a healthy weight. It gives a few more descriptors, but you gotta scroll through these links to find something. It's not as clear as anyone would suspect, and to be honest with you, it's pretty complicated. Not just to get to the information, but the actual information itself. How do we eat right? 
when the same lettuce is in a McDonald's hamburger as is on your shelf, how are you really knowing what you're getting and how are you knowing what the concentration of nutrition is and how do you even know if what I'm saying is all smoke and McDonald's is saying the truth. So, so these are some of the nuances in the metabolic facade that I call it, which is again in some of the other writings, but it's a facade and it is a media campaign and it is very, very interesting that our GDP has gone from 5% to 20% in the last 50 years for healthcare expenditures. But no one really knows exactly what to eat, how to combat the disease process. <coughs> this is a, a little bit more of the in-depth discussion here. It's very small print. I'm sorry for the, um, for the snippet of this website, but again, it, it is directly cdc.gov. Healthy weight eating. Not on here at all does it actually say what in general would be good, except for the very center. And it says meats, poultry, fish, beans, eggs, nuts, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, fat free or low fat milk, milk no products. Where, where are you supposed to get any more information besides that? Now, there are lots of organizations, but it's just really general. To me. I would suspect if someone wants to lose weight, they should have ready access information from our. US CDC. I went through the Trade Act of 1990 that everyone should be moderately familiar with regarding the organics. First, first document. In this, in this entire 129 page document, I just did a little search. This is the first thing I did on this organic document. I looked for the terms macronutrient, micronutrient. Micro, microbiologic, microorganism, mineral, nutrients, nutrient density, nutrient management, nutrition, nutritional sciences, and nutritional value. And as you'll see, out of 129 pages, I have what? Five, six, eight, nine, ten, eight, eight. Maybe like 15 or 16 words based on nutrition. Now that is not the overall encompassing topic of each sentence those are in either. Those are all listed on some cases. places. It just shows that Nutrition really is not one of the main components of an organic market. In this particular subcategory of this document, it says fertility management must not contaminate crops, soils, or water with plant nutrients, pathogens, heavy metals, or prohibited substances. For the organic consumer organization, only 5% of all agriculture was considered an organic inside of a sales situation. This 95% wasn't. That is a massive part, uh, portion of our, our agriculture that is untapped when the organic market is restricting only 5% of the market. So now when you think about it, 19 out of 20 sales options really could be optimized. We can increase nutrient. We could do something other than any of the bylaws of all the entire organic market that says you can't do this. Well, 95% says we can, so these steps, perhaps all of us. This is the National Organic Program, U.S. Department of Agriculture. The very last line, our regulations do not address food safety or nutrition. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is not a joke, this is right off the website very clearly articulated. Another part of this, allowed and prohibited substances. Substances primarily, the primary use is not as a preservative or to recreate or improve flavors, colors, textures, or nutritive value lost during processing. So even if you're getting the food and it's not altered, but for some reason in your processing or canning, whatever it is, you lose some sort of vitamin, you denature the protein, you do whatever it is, you can't even alter it back to the initial value. Oh, but that's right, you don't know the initial value to begin with. Those are problems, significant problems in what we need. And all we're doing is bringing about a question and we're going to demonstrate a potential option for correcting this variable that's been missed for so long. I mentioned before the United States Preventive Service Task Force, grade recommendations, A, B, C, D, I. A and B are pretty good, C is in, D is don't do, and I is absolutely contraindicated. So for diabetes screening, basically, 
the arrows pointing to clinicians should offer or refer patients with abnormal blood glucose to intensive behavioral counseling interventions to promote a healthful diet and physical activity. It's not an A. Why? <clears throat> I don't know. I, I don't know. I would say that with everything we know, it should be in A. And in some recent publications, the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force has been called out on that. Again, another one, weight loss morbidity. Behavioral interventions, wondering what's going to happen, are people really going to change or are they not going to change? It basically says, we are we, are we looking at integral behavioral modifications? Are we looking at multiple behavior components? This is a category B. If we don't educate people and let them know what they actually could be eating, no one's going to make an informed decision. And this one really is interesting. Healthy diets, physical activity for cardiovascular disease prevention. Who here has heard of a heart attack? <laughs> right, right. So inside of this, it's basically saying that um, I'm, just, I'm just going to read it because it's interesting. The Preventive Service Task Force recommends that primary care professionals individualize the decisions to offer or refer adults without obesity who do not have hypertension to seek abnormal blood glucose levels or diabetes to behavioral counseling to promote a healthful diet and physical activity. This is basically saying if <coughs> they already have the symptoms of the disease, we think they're fine, so we're not going to refer them and talk to anybody. And they give it a C because they don't believe that this actually is something that um, is important. So this just shows a recommendation that is entirely skewed. By essence, there are four incredibly large variables when it comes to prevention. There's primordial, primary, secondary, tertiary. Primary and primordial are basically where we want to be striving for. And almost everything inside of medicine is secondary and tertiary after the disease process is hit after a medical condition has been diagnosed and after some sort of pharmaceutical has been recommended or implemented. Life and productivity basically relies on metabolic rate, which ultimately comes down to the nutrient content of what we eat, in my opinion. Just like if you're driving a Ferrari and you give yourself 88 octane instead of the actual high octane or racing fuel that Ferrari is designed for, your engine's gonna be kaput. And that's exactly what we are. We are Ferraris. We need high octane nutrients. Mineral trace uh, elements and soils and plants. Uh, you can find the third edition online, download it as a PDF. And I strongly encourage everybody to uh, actually see this book. This will be your baseline for seeing what we have in our grocery stores for the, the nutrient quality of our food. Um, prior to this book, I my resources for my work were very limited. This book will give you uh, the food quality in a grocery store in a fresh weight, a dried weight, or an ash weight. On the Dr. Duke's database, everything is an ash weight. If you do not have the factoring number to convert from a fresh weight to an ash weight, it's meaningless. So the Dr. James Duke database will have the mineral content of different plants and the plant <coughs> updating the minerals, but you have absolutely no way to bring it back to a meaningful number on your farm. A few examples of micronutrients that are in that book and, and to see how they have a, an effect on our health. Um, we open up the book and we can see, uh, if you look here, the daily recommended amount for chromium is uh, 120 micrograms. That number is based upon a man's needs, uh, not a child's. But we're gonna use, if you see that number, and, I, and I'm pointing to that number on anything, uh, it's, it's the RDA for a man, uh, recommendation. These are all, oops, these are all uh, fresh weight values and uh, parts per million doing the conversion to uh, determine how many grams you would need to, uh, sorry, to make that RDA. This is how many grams divided by 454. This is how many pounds of produce you would need every day 
<laughs> to achieve the daily recommended amount of chromium just on the RDA. Yeah, you, if you go to the salad bar at lunch tomorrow, one person should eat that. Tell them so. <laughs> this is this is the poor quality of our food. This is this is exactly why we're doing what we're doing right here. But is it chromium in a lot of foods? So no. we're getting a little bit of different sources. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I just took a question, but I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. The only reason why we're living today and not dying is we eat meat. You can achieve that in a serving of meat. But it's, but it's a protein of an animal-based protein, harder to digest. The doctor could talk about that more. We'll get to that at the end of the talk. I, I just need to go through these. But, but I'll come on that. Yeah, come on that. Yeah, it's, it's medical. I, you won't want to listen to me on it anyway. Um, so when we, when we look at this, you know, if you're going to land on Mars and the ship is leaving, grow potatoes. That's, that's going to give you at least your best chance. Um, so, you know, when we look at the chemical activities of chromium, the Dr. Duke's database chart, I believe, has probably 60 or 70 chemical activities of chromium. And that's, that's what that poster is all about. You know, these are just a few of them, but it's, it's so important. You know, chromium is so vital to our health and, and to, you know, e even lead poisoning, chromium is, is uh, detoxic to that. All right. <clears throat> so let's look at selenium. Once again, the RDA is 55. That's how many pounds you would have to eat of product to achieve that RDA. There's, there's an important part to the poster over there. The, the RDA for a human man is 55 micrograms. The, the USDA, not the FDA, the USDA says for anti-tumor breast cancer, you need 333 micrograms. So multiply that by at least five or six. That's how many pounds to achieve that. If you're a diet, if you're um, if you're a vegetarian, you're dying. If you're not growing your own food of some higher quality <coughs> than what's on our marketplace. <coughs> so again, you know, selenium chemical activity of selenium. Dr. Duke has an entire list. Um, that list is there. These are just a few. It's, it's critical, the areas in the world that have the lowest AIDS uh, numbers and the lowest cancer numbers have the highest bioavailable selenium. And, and it isn't because of the, the way they live their lives in, in uh, Senegal, Africa. The highest, uh, lowest level of AIDS in Senegal, Africa, it's, it's a tribal community no different than other communities in Africa, but the incidence of AIDS has very minimal. When, when we're looking at plant uptake, this is, this is the absolute most important part. If you don't take anything out of this class, understanding the slide is critical. We're going to walk through it so you will understand it. This, this is plant uptake. Right here, in that little box, that's what the plant is capable, that particle size. You know, you, you can look up here and you'll see gravel, dirt, silt. You know, everybody will talk about rock dust. Rock dust is a slow release, they'll all say that. I mean, it's, it's, it'll degrade probably over a thousand years or a million years. But, but if, they, if you can't see a measurable intake or uptake into your plants, don't buy the product. If they can't prove it, if somebody's got a, a, a magic pill out there that says we can increase the uptake in your plant. It's so easy to see and measure a plant tissue test. Don't buy a product if they haven't went through that entire process of proving it. You're just wasting your money, putting something on your field, and especially fertilizer grade products. It might say 21% sulfur. What the heck is a rest? You know, even, even if it's organic certified, what the heck is a rest? So, so just to give you an, uh, an idea, this, we all, we all know DNA. That's the particle size of DNA. Your entire building blocks for your life have to come out of these foods you eat. It has to be in a particle size that size for you to properly 
absorb it and to make tissue. When we look at all of the conditions on that, on that uh, poster over there, all of those conditions are mineral deficiencies. They're not illnesses. They're the lack of, of receiving these minerals in your food. When, when we look at lead, and I'll only talk a little bit on lead just for a second. We'd love to give another talk on lead sometime. But we put 13.2 billion pounds of lead into the atmosphere in a particle size that size right there. Bioavailability of lead from lead gasoline is unbelievable. The ability for the plant to take up lead is incredible. You can take up more lead in a plant than you can take chromium, which detoxifies the lead. One of the other key components, that DNA has many, many different mineral elements to it. That is a building block for life. Different parts of our body, different tissues, require different mineral DNA. Um, if, you're, if you're not achieving the proper building blocks, you're gonna have stem cells that don't convert to tissue. You're gonna have stem cells <coughs> running to parts of your body that just do not conform to your body. The doctor could talk about that too. But I wanna look at, to show you exactly what we're looking at when we're looking at the particle size here. You know, this is dust. Um, we've all seen microscopes. A microscope is right through here. Uh, electron microscope can only see to here. Whenever you've seen a, a, an image of DNA, you've always seen an animated bit, uh, image. We cannot see DNA. We can see some viruses with our capability. Uh, we, can, we can detect some minerals based upon their intensity <coughs> reflecting, but we cannot see a metal ion in a plant. We can only take it and, and actually measure the percentage that, that's returning back to the, from the spectrum. The other, the other key parts, uh, x-ray, you know, the x-ray fluorescents that are out there, I, I, I believe are great tools. We're in that range. Um, if you hear about carbon char, here's carbon black. It's not small enough for uptake. When you use carbon char on your fields, what we found with plant uptake is it actually absorbs the minerals that we're putting in, the bioavailable minerals that we're putting in the field. It's actually less when we add carbon to it. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions? Anybody not understand how, what, what the significance of that size is? Because I'll, I'll take the time to go through it before we move on, because this is, this is absolutely key for you to understand how to manage a garden. Uh, yeah, two questions, go ahead. Are <coughs> microbes capable of taking uh, rock mineral or plant applied new, or soil applied nutrients, are they, I would think if you're capable of breaking it down to that molecular, that smaller particle size in order for optimum uptake, or are you suggesting that you need to have um, pulverized material that's already brought down to that um, particle size? Is that? You, um, to answer your question, the microbes do amazing. They, they will dissolve. Uh, particles and, and we'll, we'll go through just a little bit of touch on that but, but you're absolutely right the microbes can break it down the spin of water you know we're, we're talking about uh, particle size 10 to 100 times the size of the atom <coughs> colloidal is way too big and colloidal you can um, you know if you've ever worked with colloidals in solution the only way you know that they're there is to look through light and it gives a prism spectrum of the particles we can't see these particles. We can't, you know, if you, if you have a rock list, if your particles are so big, you're, you're still way up over into here. Mm -hmm. You know, microscope, if, when you get to the point where you can't see that particle, you still have to go further to mm -hmm. say this is the size. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, um, there was one other question. Yeah, just, I'm sorry, forgive me. I, I'm probably the only one in the audience to whom this applies, but I don't follow any of the here's and there's and the oh, I'm sorry. visuals. <laughs> sorry. So if you can be a little bit more explicit, uh, I, I um, can follow you more easily. Thanks. Well, what we're um, discussing is uh, what, when we, the particle size for plant uptake is smaller than we can see with our lab equipment. It's uh, 
It's actually smaller than, than particles of cigarette smoke. Um, does that help? Yes. Thank you. Okay. It's, uh, go ahead. Um, when you said, it sounded like you said that the biochar was actually absorbing the minerals that you were putting into the soil. Was that exactly what you said? That's, that's correct. Yep. Does that mean then at um, some time in the future, the microorganisms are able to extract it from the biochar since the biochar has these cavities and so forth? It's almost like it was a sponge. Which you the, would then extract things from? The, the decay of biochar is probably 100 years. When we're using our minerals, we're wicking it into wood so the microbes can actually feed on it uh, in, in a reasonable amount of time. We're, we're, when we put in our minerals, we're feeding the microbes, so we'll get to that. But, but when, you, when we would do the same thing with the biochar, when, when we use carbon, we use it in water filtration to take minerals out. And it holds on to it so tight. If, if, if it didn't hold on to it, filter with, with carbon wouldn't work. You know, the fact that you can load carbon uh, onto the filter is very good. And it does give you a release, but it's just a slow release. It's bound that tight by a mole molecular bond. Right. I was, I, it looks like, tell me if I'm wrong, but are you saying basically the only uptake, the only minerals that are, that are absorbed are water in ions and solutions? What it looks like, you're saying that's right? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. It's, but, you know, we don't see viruses growing up in the plant. We'll see plants with viruses, mm -hmm. but we, we don't see those viruses coming up through, through the plant. I'm going to go ahead and move on, press on. So, soil solutions, we, I originally started soil solutions, originally started soil solutions just from reading a book, I, I'm not an agronomist. Sewage treatment, water treatment. Um, I worked pulling metal ions out of water for you know 20 years, 30 years now. Um, what we, I read a book that, that uh, discussed back in, uh, and you can find this on the World Health Organization. Back in the 1970s, when cisplatinate had come out, they thought this was the, the absolute miracle for cancer treatments. They also tried to put platinum into food with the intent that if you ate the platinum, you could actually deli deliver the minerals instead of chemotherapy. They're, like most scientists, they open up the, the chemical reference book, the water-soluble form of platinum was, you know, a platinum was a three or six valence. The problem with that is it's highly poisonous to the plants, the microbes, everything. They had zero uptake of platinum into the plants that they were trying to, to raise. And, and all that's well documented. Um, if you were to buy, we, we've done tests on organic uh, lettuce at Walmart. We can get six parts per billion. The work that I was um, actually doing in the oil field and looking at minerals, we've seen platinum all the time in oil field waste. Very tough to get up. The bond on it is super tight. But we were able to reverse engineer that platinum bond in the oil field. We didn't use oil field waste for making it. We, we bought 395 platinum, uh, converted it, bonded it to, to micronutrients, and we fed the micronutrients. We ended up with a, a platinum uptake of 2,000. You fed that to the plant. Pardon? You, said, you fed it. You didn't say who you fed it to. You fed it to the plant. Yeah, we fed it to the plant. Yeah. We, we, we took that and we fed it to the plant. We had a tissue plant uh, platinum rating of 2,500 parts per billion. It, it took it three or four tries to get there. Uh, but it was easily accomplished by feeding it to the micronutrients that fed it to the plants and, and through that method. I, I did uh, um, two other metals. We did resinium, we've seen for lung cancers, and, uh, and uh, um, so and ruthenium was for lung cancer and uh, um, lymphoma. Lady had come in, uh, said, you know, I'm taking all these supplements um, and minerals. I have colorful pee, but that's about all I feel. And I said, well, just go pee in your garden. Next year, we'll come up in the plants. And then when you get supplements, uh, you'll actually gain in a form. That night, I listened to some stupid joke I said to that lady, and I developed the GTF formula. Started started formulating 
The reason why we did the GTF formula is any diabetics taking the blood sugar would see an immediate result if our theory and hypothesis was correct that, that we could have an effect on health through <clears throat> soil. We, we developed based upon just, just like what the CDC had, all of these major health conditions. We started, we, we actually had six formulas addressing major health conditions. And it wasn't just one mineral. You know, the work that I, I put into this was addressing amino acids. If you were, if you had diabetes, taking chromium without a proper liver function to bond nutrients to, to uh, uh, the enzyme, to proteins to the chromium molecule, sending it out to the blood, it wouldn't, it wouldn't reduce blood sugar unless your liver function was right. So we looked at liver function, which was molybdenum, huge for liver function. And, and then we, we put in the other minerals, vanadium, zinc, um, sulfur, you know, all, all to address the, the reduction of, of uh, glucose and blood sugar. Uh, sure. I'm going to just keep going on. Uh, you know, this is what our label looked like. An, an absolute target that made me with, with the FDA. Um, it, but. I wasn't feeding it to people, I was feeding it to the soil. USDA, Wyoming Department of Agriculture approved that label. Um, what we put onto this label, and they approved all of our labels, even our food labels, but we, 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 we thought we'd get to the food. So, so this is a package of minerals that we're putting into this. This will treat a 10 by 10 garden. All of our minerals that we put into it are reagent grade. Food grade or better is the very minimum that we used. When, when we put in uh, silver into, into uh, our, our soil conditioners, we started out with three, five, three nines fine silver and converted it. The intention was, is I didn't want to add something to somebody who has an illness or symptom that was even gonna make them worse. We test all of our, you'll see later that we test all of our food for heavy metals, our soils for heavy metals. This is that poster. I don't know if this will work, but if you want to scan the, the code, then we can walk through it. But it, it. You might just knock down my website if too many people do it, because I, I, my website's in a server in a basement somewhere in Chicago bathroom or something. <laughs> but anyway, we, this, is, uh, uh, this is that poster. If, 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 you, if it doesn't download right, WesternEnvironmentalServices.com, the second page of that has that poster. And it's all one word, WesternEnvironmentalServices.com. Can you keep going? But, yeah. All right. Any mineral deficiency shouldn't be treated as a mineral deficiency. It should be treated as malnutrition. Anytime you go to the doctor, but how you can tell if you have an illness that's affected by a mineral deficiency, just Google it. Say mineral, defi or mineral deficiencies associated with diabetes, mineral deficiencies associated with Crohn's disease, anything. I just challenge you any, anywhere that, that uh, there are minerals that affect most of our conditions. Our problem is we accept terminology like illnesses. We look at pre-diabetes and we, and we say that, well, thank God I don't have diabetes anymore. If, you, if you're to the point where you need insulin, your damage is so bad to turn you around with nutrition is one major obstacle. But that uh, uh, graph that, that doctor uh, put up to get you back up to normal is, is tough. So this is Dr. James Duke, amazing gentleman. He's the one that made this database. He passed away a little bit over two years ago. Um, I had a chance to meet him in, in his gardens after he retired. Uh, he wrote a number of different books uh, outside of the uh, USDA. The one question that I asked him was what was specific about the soils that he used. He had absolutely no controls on the soils. It was wherever the plant grew. So in his book, in his book, the this reference to the minerals that the plants take up is flawed. Because he didn't have this type of work that are, are different variables that we could put in the soil that we have today. So when so if his work is 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 missing that maximum loading capacity or what the plant's capable of delivering, 
we have another challenge. We have a challenge to see what did God design that plant to deliver to you? All the plants are the same as they were you know, 100 years ago. We might have converted a few different uh, changes in it, but basically it's just like us. We're humans, the plants are plants. Those plants are capable of delivering that same amount of nutrition a thousand years ago as it can be today. They just need to have access to these minerals. So quick, is it possible when you're comparing soil versus, say, hydroponic, and with some people going in that area, trying to say they're organic, and doing a comparison between the two, is it possible that people who deliver hydroponics can deliver a highly nutritious end product compared to soil that seems to have some unusual things in it that aren't identified? If, if, um, if you were to ask me about hydroponics, I would have said this is absolutely impossible. But you're going to see something amazing at the end of this, the end of this presentation. Uh, I've got to make it a little faster. So, um, maximum loading capacity. In, in this book, this is the same book that you can download. This is just a second uh, edition of it. What we're capable with our soil amendments was to see values, uh, boron and soil <coughs> values in lettuce. Uh, boron had a value in this book of 1,300 parts per billion. Our boron in our memory formula was able, we were able to see a value in lettuce of 431,000 parts per billion. When we look at cobalt, uh, that's the level of cobalt in lettuce, 210. We're able to, to raise that cobalt level to uh, 6,970. What that looks like when you look at plants' maximum loading capacity, that number that we're able to achieve, nobody can achieve these numbers. If they do, send me a certified analysis and I'll put your name and number up there too. I'm not saying that I'm the only one that can do this. I'm the only one with a database right now of, of the, these numbers. But, but this, this is important for us to absolutely start documenting our, our maximum loading capacity of plants so we know exactly what these plants are capable of doing so we have a target to achieve. So what that means is I put my numbers at 100%. I can't find anybody else with a higher number, so it's 100%. We take the value that we see in our grocery store, and this is what you see. You see less than 1% of that plant's capacity for boron. You see less than 3% of the plant's capacity for cobalt. Right down the line, when um, Keith, or, uh, when Dan Kittredge talks about plant loading and saying that we're only using 10% of our brain, it's because our foods are only delivering 10% of what they're capable of doing. When we're talking about how many pounds you need to eat, when you talked about how many pounds you need to eat, um, this is the difference between our product. Oops. This is the difference between our product, 0.2 pounds to achieve a day recommended amount of boron compared to six to six. Point, you know, half a pound molybdenum compared to 33 pounds. That density of minerals is equivalent to meat. You can actually, if you're a vegetarian, you can actually go to um, feel comfortable being a vegetarian because you're getting the same amount of nutrient content of meat. Calories. This is this is a big part. You know, this these controls weren't out of that book. These were the difference between my two uh, test. Oops. I might have uh, between my two tests where, where I just had the same soil, just added the soil amendments, these were the difference. If we were comparing it to, to the grocery store, um, it, it would be a much greater amount of calories that we would need to achieve. If, if you're not understanding it, if you had one serving of the memory formula wheatgrass to get the equivalent in our controls, you would have to eat 66 servings. Uh, this, this was still good soil over here. 
This was the same song. This one here, we just added that one farm. So, I'll end with it. All right. Let me go back one slide real quick. This, this section at the bottom where it has the calorie density, over 1,500 calories versus 97 calories, it's a very important understanding. What has happened in the last 50 to 60 years specifically, the same time period of disease process, in the beginning of that of our presentation with the exponential curve, going up with disease and expense, you'll notice that the calorie density was low and the nutrient density was high back then. It's completely inverted itself where the calorie density is high and the nutrient density is low. And everyone's metabolism in this room and on the rest of the planet's surface all depends on the limiting reagent for any equation to work. If you need five eggs to make your cake, you're not going to make the same cake with two eggs. It's just not going to happen. Same thing with your body's metabolic processes, whether you're creating urine or thinking and remembering for an exam or growing bones as a 12-year-old female, it does not matter. All the equations are the same. They always go to the lowest common denominator. If you are ingesting 97 calories of traditional food, you're at 115 in mineral density of really what you have have because the density is low and you're trying to reduce calories. So every day in my clinic, I see people coming in saying, you know, I'm 362 pounds, I've starved myself for the last 30 days and I lost one pound. It's because your metabolism is super low to begin with and you just shut it down even farther and now you've minerally uh, depleted yourself to the next level and your body has equivalent, uh, uh, neutralized itself at a one pound loss. And it's slowed its metabolism down even farther to conserve what energy it has because now it thinks it's in a starvation state. If you add nutrients, your body's metabolism will pick up and you'll actually lose weight. Has anyone here ever heard of the philosophy you gotta eat weight or eat food to lose weight? Yeah. Well, this is the exact principle behind it. The only way that the last 20 or 30 years worth of exercise has come into play is because you can eat more calorie by getting somewhat of the nutrient density you need, but now you're at a calorie overload, so you gotta burn it off. Hence why fitness has become a big contributing factor to basically everyone's existence here in the United States at least. Robert, can you explain how that last slide relates to the known principle of people living longer on a low calorie diet and how your formula allows you to achieve it, like you're eating meat. We can, we'll answer that at the end. There's a lot of questions that are really good, but we yeah. gotta get to the end of this. We'll, okay. we'll get to it. Yep, and that's a great question, and we actually have some information on that. Um, so basically, one of the end parts here that is important from a medical standpoint, and I'm not going too in detail here because I'm not presenting to an entire audience of MD PhDs, right? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get this out there to the masses and ask what public health is in general, right? Basically, we're looking at an immune system and the way I correlate this is we gotta have certain minerals and micronutrients that bind to others so the plant can uptake it and use it. Similarly with our immune system and our intestinal tracts and our body, we have a white blood cell, we have antibodies, and the antibodies go after the bad things. Okay, so in general, if you think about um, different cells and how they relate, they have a symbiotic relationship. One of these is a uh, dendritic cell, and the other is a T cell. And ultimately, what happens is these are all part of your white blood cell spectrums. And if you think about an antigen, which would be something that's bad floating in your bloodstream, the white blood cells see it but they have to have a marker on it to say it's bad, so an antibody is there and it latches onto the bad thing and says, hey, red flag, I'm a bad thing. The white blood cell sees the red flag, it goes after it eats it. Leaky gut, we all heard about some of the discussions this morning about how things can kind of come back out in our immune system to fight these things. We have plans with bowel, prone, you know. Ultimately, an antibody has two receptor sites. The antigen, which is the bad thing, can actually lock onto the tip here, and then the white blood cell comes in and attacks it because this little red flag is floating around saying, hey, I'm bad. Similarly, 
and on the street that similarly to the humoral immune system re requiring cells, antibodies, and antigens, and cytokines, which are little things that float around in the body again and say, hey, I'm a red flag, this is bad, white blood cell, come eat me. The function property of plant uptake of nutrient depends upon many specific factors, including the ribosomal soil labor, layer and its byproducts, biologic metabolites, the soil soups, for optimal nutrient uptake by the plant. So this is where the biomimicry comes into play. The plant will recognize something as, as good and it will absorb it, or it will recognize it as bad and keep it out. We want the plant to recognize nutrient as good. So we have to label it with something that says this is good. Here it is plant, eat this, take it up so then we can ingest it. That's the whole point of a plant growth process when we're actually growing something for our human mass consumption or animal consumption, which ultimately downstream could also be human consumption. So epigenetics comes into play. I kind of hit this a little bit at the beginning regarding how certain exposures cause certain plants to have upregulation of absorption or upregulation of produce or product. That ultimately comes out to being more weight for the product for the farmer, and that means more value for the farmer, which ultimately says, hey, we want to have a higher weight. So I heard of someone talk yesterday about tomatoes, went from 18 pounds or something to 30 pounds or something like that. That's a pretty big gain for one growing season. Now, what if you can have that type of growth with a measurable nutrient density that then separates you from your competitor, or separates one state from the other state, or by lower, separates one country's commodity exchange with the global commodity exchange. So pearls, um, we, want to, we want to actually alter environmental options for nutrient delivery to plants. We believe that there is an epigenetic profile that is an underlying agent to this. We are trying to mitigate nutrient loss and increase nutrient density in plants for animal and human consumption. Um, the Health Medical Institute is involved at this point in developing some sort of a, a certification, some sort of a nominal value license of sort that basically says you send a sample and we're going to get you this particular nutrient concentration on what you have currently and what you could have. This is not anything regulated by any other body than us. And we are trying to get this out there to help all of the agricultural producers right here get an optimal nutrient density in their own crop, in their own produce, to then up sale the market. Difference here, organic certifications <coughs> have nothing to do with nutrient density. They only have to do with what you don't add to it. None of the things we use have any type of GMO. None of the things we use have any other type of classic fertilizers. By the way, anybody wants these slides, I think they're available. Yeah, we'll have them available. On, on our website, give us a couple. Give us a couple days to to get them up uh, next week. We'll have You'll have access to all the slides. So there's cards here and there's handouts too on our website. The other piece of this is, you know, when we start thinking about cattle, a lot of people create silage. Some of my best friends, thousand acre corn, they give to the cattle, they sell it off. But what if the cattle could have not only what they already measure with carb and protein, but what if the cattle could actually have a nutrient density? For silage, it gave them an extra 15 pounds a head. Whoa. And what if their vet bill was cut in half per head? Yeah, it's absolutely possible. And what if that extra 15 pound per head was not only something there for, for say, more milk processing or whatever, but also for human consumption? Now you've increased meat nutrient density as well. Now I, I am a firm believer in a solid, nutrient-dense, plant-based diet. Um, I am not opposed to having a steak periodically, but I do think that nutrient-dense uh, product is where it's at, irrespective of where you get it. Um, so this is one of the focuses. We're trying to correct malnutrition. This is the beginning of the nearing of the end here for everybody. This is so, the soil amendments that you've seen earlier at the end of the year were discontinued. Uh, we believe that uh, the approach of going after chronic illnesses is, is, is the wrong approach for marketing. Uh, we believe that uh, coming into uh, a, a new method of delivery, 
something that uh, calls us to monitor nutritional density not because of a disease, because we want 100 percent participation in prevention of disease. Uh, our, our intention is that on, on our new products and this new patent that we've, uh, we've submitted is that when we go to the market, we're capable of identifying a nutritional value. When we go to our farms, we're capable of planting and attaining a <coughs> density value that is consistent. So when we go to the grocery store, if you see a brand name Naturally Noble, you're gonna know that that's 100% tested and 100% consistent. So if you if you were to see 20 years from now, or if not five years from now, I'm hoping, uh, a label on Naturally Noble, you'll be able to scan that and know exactly when you're making a salsa, where you're at in your daily record or not. And that's achievable through this method. So our garden soils, we, we just use a garden box. Uh, it, was a, it was a very limiting factor for our process, but we could control in that garden box. We knew, that we knew what minerals we were adding. We knew what we were harvesting. We knew the plant tissue test. We knew anything that was a waste went back in it. If we didn't lose water, we had 100% accountability for knowing the content of the minerals in that box 100% accountability of the bioavailability, and we knew when to replenish the soil. What happened just a couple months ago was, what if this was part of that system? This is a contained system. I was completely against hydroponics. If, if you go tell Dan Kittrich, I was talking about hydroponics in here, that we could, that we were, were in favor of it now, he, he'll probably fall over, so I'm going to have to catch him because he doesn't even know that we're talking about this right now. <laughs> but, but what this what this means is our focus is on malnutrition. Our new product line, for the first year, will not be packages of minerals; they'll be each individual minerals. Each individual mineral that we're we're producing um, has a has a very consistent value. They're all produced out of reagent grade or boiling grade metals. Um, what's critical about using this method is if you wanted to apply this on your garden or your fields, it's still possible. The problem is it's pretty expensive. If somebody came up to me right now and said, hey, I've, I've got uh, you know 500 acres, we could do this cheap. But nobody's come up to me yet in, in all the research and says, I want to implement this. Because it's still relatively expensive. But to buy reagent grade and metric bulk is very cheap, pennies on the dollar compared to what I'm paying right now for making these supplements. But we're not limited to just what you see here. Like if you have an idea, if, you're, if you have the ability to mass produce food and you want to do this, we're all in. That's, that, that actually is part of the scalability that, that we were discussing, that this could be anything from a local home, a local at home unit, that you can then have a hydroponic vertical on your wall, all the way to the scalable, hey, I got a thousand acre silage, I gotta get this going, I got one, one year left to turn a profit, I had hail the last two years, let's rock this out and do this. These are all things that are um, very scalable very quickly, at a very economical cost, and the risk to benefit is very minimal because of the initial investment, you get a huge return. And if you guys or anyone you know is the first one doing it, think about how that would change the commodity in your local area. You might not, you might get your thousand acre ranch addition next year just based on a profit. You go from that. Our, our the other key part to our success is. Um, is our base soils. Um, if you were to add our products to your soil, I wouldn't recommend you do it until you actually did a plant tissue test to see what contaminants you have. Um, there is absolutely no value in feeding people lead. And lead is, you know, we talked a little bit about it, um, how bad a lead gasoline has contaminated our fields. Now, there, there is still something that you can do with your fields. Don't ever sit there and say, well, I'm contaminated, I can't do anything. 
What, what this does, this cattle manure that was mineralized fed from a feeding operation uh, uh, during their calving and conception operation. The minerals that they gave to the cattle, just like what I said to the lady that came in and said, I sure have colorful pee. Most of those minerals not, are, are passed through. They're not absorbed. They're in that compost pile. You keep that separate, it's liquid gold. The other key part is if, if you're mineralizing and you're giving zinc, zinc will bond to lead in the bloodstream. It won't pass into the blood-brain barrier. It won't pass into the, the bone marrow. It will bond to a large enough uh, particle size where the liver will capture it and hold on to it. Critical, even if your kids have lead poisoning, is to ensure that that lead isn't migrating into, into the passive blood-brain barrier. So, so from the medical side here, as we're doing, doing the animals, um, from a lead experience, lead poisoning is a unique concept. You know, the, the public health departments everywhere around the country, they're very, very keen on lead poisoning. Lead poisoning itself is a, is a misnomer, in my opinion, because it only is at a critical level do they say, hey, you have potential for neurologic decompensation or neurologic chronic illness. A smoldering lead can lead to emotional disruption, can lead to developmental disorders at a smoldering rate. So when you start thinking about what is a recommended daily amount, also think about that's the minimal amount to prevent a disease process, or the minimal amount that your body can focus on for an optimal nutrition activity level. So when someone says you're supposed to have one milligram of X for function, well, that may be the case, but it's also the minimal amount for function. What if you could have more? What if you could function at a greater rate? Your disease processes would go down. The uh, reversal of our existing disease processes can actually transpire. So to go back to this ranch in, 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 our, in our garden, so um, you can make this yourself. Uh, we, we prefer ours because we know what's in it. So if you're, if you're mimicking what we're trying to accomplish, and you can do that if you have a hydroponic situation, um, we're, we're testing all of our heavy metals. Uh, the Health Ranger had, had a scale. Our detection limits are a little bit different, so we, we incorporated their scale. We had to change just a few numbers. But, but uh, what we're seeing is everything is made A plus or better uh, in the quality. Different plants will take up lead at different levels. If you put on a broccoli in there, you might see a higher lead content, just because that's the nature of, of the broccoli. It isn't that you put this in and every plant's gonna have that type of uptake. Each plant is separate, each plant has its own unique healing capabilities plus mineral uptake. These, these two garden boxes, um, you know, th this one here's uh, a garden box, Eco Garden Systems out of Minnesota. <coughs> We got a warehouse of those. Uh, they they change their design and they they, uh, they they build garden boxes for the cannabis market and the cannabis market kind of falls apart every time a state legalizes cannabis. <laughs> this other um, garden box, the 100% recycled. This this is actually a, a tote. Um, even the, the well, not 100% recycled. That's a plastic pipe and that's a piece of wood. But but uh, that plastic is recycled plastic. Um, nature's composites out of uh, Torrington, Wyoming, recycles plastic. Makes them make amazing fencing, decking material, great for, for the environment. Eco Garden, our Eco Garden System with Garden Box, Nature's Composite is a plastic recycler. It's great for making uh, you know, garden boxes. All right, so these are the, the minerals that we're working with, what you see in the green. Um, um, maybe, please. There, there's actually 20 right now. We, we've uh, developed almost 38 so far as soil amendments. We only market these 20. Uh, we had some other formulas that we didn't put out on the market with uh, trace minerals. We, we have some formulas that we're just holding on to for a while, basically until somebody comes up with a, the medical claim that we can promote it to. But, uh, uh, there, there's a lot of information that, that um, longevity can be doubled with a few trace minerals. Uh, we, 
we can't say any more than that, but, but we believe that, that work that, that was done. But so we're looking at what you see in the green, and each one of those are, are soil uh, <coughs> amendments that will be coming out on the first of the year. They're not available right now. I have to pay a registration fee and still get them uh, through the uh, USDA. But this is how we plan on, on, on using these in the hydroponic situation. Each individual garden box <coughs> we maintain uh, on each uh, water uh, reservoir coming out and feeding the hydroponics. Uh, we, can, we can actually maintain the amount of minerals coming out. The important part on this is you, you've seen aquaponics uh, where you're using fish to provide the nutrients. We're using the microbes in the soil along with these minerals to provide the nutrients. <coughs> Standard hydroponic situation, but rather than using fish, we know that we, we're seeing these minerals in this water and we can control the rate that we're putting in individually. If, if we have a plant that demands more boron, we can add another boron box. We will still, what, we don't, what you don't see here is a, a control garden. We, we can actually put a control garden in there, know what minerals are actually coming out of our, our, our soil feedstock, but we can adjust this to feeding level to achieve maximum water capacity in the plants. And, and these boxes will show us the maximum loading capacity. There's another, another neat part of this. It's, it's more of an afterthought, but it's, it, and it came from listening to people talking here. Uh, when, when you have a soil like cobalt, cobalt is an amazing mineral. What it does to micro is uh, it, it does the same thing as, as manufacturing B12 in our stomach to help us absorb and digest other minerals. Cobalt will feed the microbes in the soil. When we have uh, cobalt in our memory formula, we've seen 20 minerals that we didn't see in our controls spike up over 10 times the uptake. It, it's amazing. That, that gives us hope for all of our gardens, saying that maybe there's one or two minerals out there that can reverse the nutritional deficiency that we're seeing and actually feed the microbes. So what we're looking at here is when we're measuring this activity, we can take, say, let's just say this one here is a cobalt. We know that we have a different microbial activity because we can measure the difference between the controls and that garden box. We can see the increase of all these other minerals that we didn't seed into that garden box. Mm -hmm. We can then take those microbials and, and just do a microbial transplant into, into one of the other garden boxes. I suggest that you do that to your fields. If you have an area of your field with high microbial activity, you get out there with a backhoe and, and do a, a microbial transplant <coughs> to the area of your field that's barren for microbial activity. Microbes colonate, they don't just appear. I think we've got done. So. I'd like to do one one quick comment on the last slide too. Is, is he, he he did a great job actually of, of, of eliciting what each of these lines and, and possibilities for specific additive can do, and then the combination and how they're symbiotic, where one may actually allow the uptake of two or seven or twenty more. My mind is the hundred thousand foot view. He's the researcher, and he looks at the nitty gritty detail. When I look at this from a business and from a healthcare perspective, this up here could be individual farms or individual plots of land or individual one acre plots sporadically put inside of a 500 acre plot. When it comes to the irrigation, you know, I've done everything from sucking those with my hands, putting water in a feed dish in my water and muck boots myself, all the way to fixing the irrigation circles. And I have a suspicion that something's gonna happen in the near future where people are gonna start putting trench lines around that have a few foot depth gravel <coughs> water retainment system that actually could mimic this for reclaiming the mineral content coming off and recirculate back through, through that specific field. Or vice versa, if you want to have the soil suit, it's very possible to do so. And now, not only do you maybe not need a thousand acres to make 
as much silage to feed the cattle. You may only need 100 acres to do the exact same thing. It doesn't mean you're going to lose profit, it just means that the value of each is different. So this is a little bit of a scalability thing from a small indoor farm operation at a personal person's property where you could have this whole setup in a quarter of that wall over there, all the way to somebody who might actually have seven or eight different 100 square acre plots that represent each of these, and they're just sort of cycled back on top of each other. Obviously, outdoors, you're going to have some, a lot actually, of the water lost to the water table, but you'll be able to at least reclaim part of that. You'll have the first pass of absorption. You'll have the second pass of absorption. And that's a future vision for you. Go ahead. Um, you did a great job of explaining how, like, putting in one mineral to unlock other minerals that you weren't adding. And when we're talking, my interest is about if we're determining these ranges of maximal or optimal um, ranges, so we're just looking at maximal. If we really don't know what the limit is, because even if you're adding more of this mineral, there could be a limiting other mineral or other factor in the DNA of that plant or microbe that isn't able to utilize other minerals that would unlock more potential. So is there anything you're doing on that side of it? Or at this, I mean, I know what you're already doing is involving a lot of complexity and trying to establish some ranges, which is really amazing. Biggest challenge for, for me is, is finance. Um, yeah. even, even for us to change from one plant to another, yeah. it's, it's you know thirty forty thousand dollars worth of analytical. Yeah. So you know most of our work right now is on wheatgrass and lettuce. We we've done most of the garden vegetables that we uh, have listed on our bags uh, of the old system. Uh, but you know I'm not a herbalist, and this needs to get uh, these tools need to get a herbalist hand because they're. Um, amazing healing properties of different uh, plants out there, different fruits that, that could utilize this. You know, for example, when we looked at um, zinc, I didn't have that slide up here, I think we cut it out because we had so many slides. But to achieve the daily recommended amount of zinc and oranges that we all eat for the vitamin C when we have the cold, you have to eat almost two, what is it, 280 pounds of oranges a day to get that, photo, you know, but, but there's a way to take and combine what we're doing. Uh, we, we know that vitamin C is very high in peppers, green peppers, sweet peppers, and also the zinc uptake out of this. So what, we could, what we're able to do is once we know these loading capacities, once we identify the plants, and we're looking for healing properties, that's where that all plays. To, to answer the other part of the question is, we know that, that the intensity of these plants, uh, that their ability to take up is all based upon the plant and the DNA of the plant and, and what that plant is, has got designed it to give us. When, when you're doing a, an analysis on your field to see your bioavailability, what you're taking is a plant tissue test. If you take it from one plant, you're only seeing the bioavailability of that one plant. If you have an entire field, uh, just pull all the weed samples, anything that's green, dehydrate them, send them to the lab. This is the lab's name, Activation Labs up in Canada. Um, this if, you're, if you're looking for it. Um, <coughs> I, I should have had a slide up here with, with their, their site. But expect slow results, um, especially, especially if it's coming from America for some reason. Uh, the, the, not, not that they're that slow, that, that border thinks that everything I send up there is marijuana. <laughs> so um, when you send it up there, they actually opened up a new division since I've started this work. Um, we, the new division is based on plant science. Where I originally looked at activation labs to achieve this data wasn't through the normal agronomy labs. Their, their mineral labs, like I say, we would see precious metals in different ways in, in, in the waste treatment systems that we were recovering. Their analysis of plant tissue was developed so on a mining claim they would go in and cut off the tops of trees, take the GPS location, take and plot the mineral content in those trees and know exactly where the gold or silver veins or tungsten veins were in the ground rather than doing core samples. That's the type of work that they've, they've done. That's why their, their certifications are securities and exchange certifications to make a, a claim on a mineral 
in Canada, you have to have that quality of lab. Uh, so, so any results that, that you see, that, that, and I'll bring up the lab analysis if you want to see it. Um, I'll put it up. When, when you see those, those analysis, those are, are, are sufficient for our labels. Those are our securities exchange. Right. Yeah, I'll put it up. We can talk some more. Any other questions? That, first one, you've been up for a little bit. Yeah, thanks. I, I'm glad you're like up in the nutritional content of food. Like, we're all teammates, but I disagree with your approach to that because like we don't we don't feed the plants, the soil food lab does, and trying to directly assess their needs is it's like ignoring all the what's happening that we can't see the soil food web and the microbes and fungal community, which is like the intelligent interface. That's like, there's a reason that once upon a time, organic included soil health, because that's what feeds the plants and gives them their nutritional density. And that's I think it's a lot of unnecessary work to do all the quantitative analysis when feeding the soil does it for us. That's actually what we're doing. You just articulated it in a different way. Um, we are actually providing food to the soil, which then allows the microbiome or the ribosome layer to create uh, a food source for the plant to uptake. And the only reason why any farmer here actually would do agricultural progress for it is to sell it for either animal or human consumption, um, for the most part. And that, that's that's actually what we're trying to do as an end product to help us as a human civilization to have a decrease in disease status currently, and also to allow our future generations to have a returnable, nutrient-dense source. Who knows if it's even for just this planet, but this is the beginning of some very intense work. Uh, and I do appreciate the comment because, yeah, we want to respect all versions of growth life. And everything that we're putting into that soil, we're feeding the microbes in the soil, everything that we're putting in is the right balance for compatibility with human life and the planet. But it, isn't that we're we're taking a, it isn't that we're taking a, a, a mineral like platinum in the, in the wrong balance or chromium in the wrong balance. That, that's, that's all the trivalence chromium that we're putting into it. It's, it's not at all that it's sloppily done. It's not at all that, that we're not nourishing the microbes in the soil. We are. We're encouraging their growth. So, yeah, the one in the back for, for more I'm sorry. Um, have you, how long have you been working with these um, soil applied amendments? And how long have you been growing food um, using these um, products? At, at least eight years now. Um, three, year you, develop, three year development on every, every soil amendment. Our new ones came out, we didn't have the three years behind it, but it's the exact same volume, quantity, and, and mineral components. We just didn't make it put six or seven of them together when they're all individual. So I know that that, that our, our uptake, the only ones out of, out of the products that I have that I'm having problems with or that we're intending is um, uh, we're having some issues with uh, silica, uh, getting that dissolved. You know, when, when we put selenium into into a soil amendment, we're, we're buying metallic selenium. Have you ever tried to digest metallic selenium? It's, it's, it's almost as tough as platinum. You know, it, it takes special environments, uh, you know, tube furnaces, doing conversion. All of our conversions just based on selenium alone before we put it into a sawdust. And, and that's what all of these products are. They're, they're minerals in the sawdust. You know, we're going through six or seven steps to detoxify it because we do toxify it when we're, when we're digesting. When we take, um, I'm going to just speak a little bit more on it. When, we, when we're taking and uh, Minerals, even, even when we were doing the, the mixed bags of compounds of minerals, uh, you have a challenge because these are all metal ions. They're all going to play down on each other. Uh, our method of, of doing that is, is to bond them to nutrients so that their polling scale, uh, you know, bonding will not play out. And, and when they're in a liquid form, they're whipped into sawdust. and, and that keeps them very stable. They're ideal for the microbials then to break down. It, is, it isn't at all, you know, if we get a liquid, and, and this is the other thing, and anybody that's done the, the course on bionutrients, uh, you know, you have a stepping stone of, of adding boron to the field. 
You can't just shock it with what you need. You have to do it over a couple of harvests. This is a slow rate. When we talked about uh, uh, carbon char, if I were to plant a tree using this methodology, and, and, and probably a few years from now, we'll have these same formulas for, for apple orchards. When they're putting that, that tree in the ground, we will wick that into carbon char, knowing that 50 year life cycle of that tree, it's a slow release. And rather than trying to do it all at once or go back into that tree and disturb the root system. Go ahead. Uh, so my continuance on that, so you've been doing it for eight years, you've been producing food with this system for eight years. Have you been, so maximal load, ma maximal nutritional load into the plant. Are you using hybrids or are you using heirlooms? You know, th there's some difference I, I, there, genetics on what plant I'll take it. But my point question is, are you tracking how um, these nutrients that are bioaccumulating in the plants then after consumption by a human, are bioaccumulating in a human? Mm. Are you are you tracking that? Mm -hmm. Like if your maximal load, how do we are you prescribing I, like four leaves of lettuce? <laughs> or you know, how are you? I I want to answer this one question. I have a mother-in-law who has uh, who has Alzheimer's. She can't stand anything green. That that piece of lettuce that in our memory form, and I made that memory form for her. <clears throat> Oh. Mm -hmm. I made that memory formula for her. One leaf of lettuce is like an entire cell. It's like 160 pieces of lettuce. You can't, you can't put a price on um, what poor diets do to people, what malnutrition looks like. We all have malnutrition. There's a key part to this, this chart. And it was uh, talked about in the last talk. If somebody in your family has something that's a symptom on the chart, chances are you have it. You're eating at that same table. It just hasn't manifested into the diabetes. It hasn't manifested into depression, but you have that exact same symptom. If you're not charting what conditions you have at the same table you're eating at, it's all a loss because your brother or your sister next to you might be an indication of what's going to happen to you if you don't address this. My whole belief is that all of those conditions go away when we deliver food to our tables that prevent these conditions. My thought was, are you tracking, are there any issues with toxicity? Are you tracking We're, we're developing all of these currently. You're looking at it in real time. Uh, again, we haven't been doing this for 50 years, and this is a new step in the evolution of agriculture. It's a new step in the evolution of, of modern medicine, in my opinion. When I look at uh, historical naturopaths or osteopaths or MDs or whatever you want to call it, a medical provider, either it's been a tincture of this, a walk of this length, a pill of this type and density and size, um, the way I see a lot of this going is, you know, supplements were developed because of this issue. So supplements are new. Done for the dose of supplements, right? They don't work. So, so, so these these supplements, and you walk down the supplement aisle, they're there because of the deficiency in the food that we eat. You go to some travel countries, they're not they're not looking to take a pill to supplements. So they're looking to find something off the ground floor. And and inside of that, they um. This particular new methodology would be for tinctures of these high nutrient dense foods. And inside of that, that is a future prospect. It is a very intuitive concept that you just mentioned. That's why I wanted to articulate on that. Oh, no, call you for this um, what, what I wanted to say is I want to go back to that other question. I commend you for your courage to move forward to address the issues, knowing that a lot of people are are dying and being very sick in this country. So I, I appreciate your effort, especially measuring against, you know, the low quality that's out there and doing a comparison. It must require a lot of work. I can see how people would fear the maximum load, but you're reassuring us that we're making these steps. Now, Doc, not, sorry, Larry Ellison, the multimillionaire, billionaire with Oracle, has gone to Hawaii, bought an island, 98% ownership of Lanai, and he has hired somebody else and spent 14 million to his buddy and decided to then 
impact Hawaii's local agriculture by doing vegetables, mainly lettuce and things that are growing in green in a greenhouse, saying that he's going to invest and bust the market there and actually deliver, you know, a whole bunch of nutritious greens and other things that can be done in the greenhouse. My doubt on this is whether with all the phytochemicals that are available in soil and other things in the soil, in the soil and, and then to compete against with limited amount of minerals that can be put into that type of hydroponic system. How can you even get close, even though we're in a bad situation where everybody's uh, you know, allowed to be nutrition, how can he compete in the market and actually deliver a high quality product so that people can actually heal? Or will he not, and is that good enough with just enough of the stuff, like you've got 20 out of maybe 72 trace minerals that are typically in the market at the health food store yeah. that you put in? One sentence as I turn this over, uh, I, I'll just be kind of general about this. Anybody who eats box food versus any type of food in the ground, they're going to get better nutrition from the ground. We're taking it to the next level. Uh, so, so that's where he can further clarify what you're saying. So again, you go to McDonald's or you get a box of food every day, nutrient, nutrient density is super poor, calories are super high. You get something that's grown in the ground, it's always going to be more healthy for you. We're trying to optimize that across the spectrum, no matter where they grow. So, to, to answer both of your questions, um, first of all, uh, worried about toxicity, taking something with too much selenium. If, if you're eating a, a, a large steak, 16 ounce steak, you're already achieving a, a super loading of minerals. The difference is, is you're not absorbing it. Why don't you absorb it? It probably has a lot to do with uh, the meat protein versus the, the vegetable protein. What I believe that would happen when you've seen all the calories, when you achieve what you need, this isn't a medical uh, thing, but when you achieve what you need, I believe your brain shuts down. When I would do it, have a garden show, we would have with the six formulas, we'd have tomatoes grown, the same variety grown in all six formulas. It was amazing when people would come up and say, I like this one better, and then you ask them about their health condition. Their brain said, I need that. Mm -hmm. The taste, was exactly what they were looking for. That taste and the connection of the brain to that food was there. I, I truly believe the only reason why we have this extra weight, especially diabetics, is it's toxins. We don't have the minerals to detoxify in our foods. And so our brain says, eat more, eat more, eat more. And we carry it on as this extra weight. I, if, if we have what we need, our brains will shut down. To answer your question, when the doctor doesn't have the testimonials that I see. I've been doing this for that long. We've been doing it for cancer patients. You know, we've, we've had people on, on type 1 diabetes that have reported back to me. I'm not, these are not medical studies that reported back to me. I need to make that clear. You know, going back and having their insulin pump adjusted down three times in a month. Wow. You know, when they're paying for that insulin because they didn't have insurance, that was yeah. important to them. The worst part about that was, is when he got insurance, he didn't care anymore. <laughs> you know, and, and that's that's a mentality that we have to overcome too. So to, to add one comment to that, diabetic with insulin pumps, I I have kind of um, had a, a patient population in my clinic that has migrated away from the average urgent care sniffle. I have a suture thing, and I do basic procedures, but I have had a calling now. Uh, in, in the communities, in, in multiple states actually, I have multiple licenses throughout the country, but the, the folks that either call me to do teleconference for a patient or inpatient, actually in my clinic in Wyoming, they come in all the time with multiple meds as I had mentioned. And when I show people graphs, when I show people graphs of the med usage and the discontinuation of meds based on lifestyle principles, when I show them to other providers, I don't show them what the red lines mean. I ask them what they think they mean. And they say, this is, wow, you, you're doing a really good job of controlling this person's blood pressure or, or glucose. You must have added uh, only maybe four meds over the course of three months. Which that's pretty good to do with only four meds. None of them. Those are the meds coming off, and the glucose is coming down, and the blood pressure is coming down, and their weight's coming down, and they're out of the hospital and they don't need to be seen every month by a primary, and they're not spending $500 a month on medications. You can see how it just continually cycles around. 
And that, which is very beautiful, you brought that particular point up, is the reason, is one of the reasons why I'm here, because you cannot separate nutrition from medicine. They are the same thing. And when I see people left and right coming off their meds and saving money, I don't do the right thing. Well, you know what I need to do? We're 15 minutes over. They are serving lunch. Dinner. It, our dinner. We will, uh, we'll stay and answer questions, but let's give it a minute for anybody who wants to put up, put up, and then we'll